who have been to our sessions before, the division now offers a variety of academic and professional development initiatives to help create an enabling environment to support academic staff in their journey to becoming uh, good teachers in higher education on an ongoing basis. Um, one such initiative um, is this particular series, the Connect at One sessions. And what these sessions do is they provide a platform to showcase the work of um, academic staff who have received Vice Chancellor's Distinguished, distinguished Awards in teaching and learning. Um, our presenter for this session is Professor Abhijide Adi Ibijola, I hope I got that right, who is actually a two times winner of the VC award. Uh, he, in 2019, he received the award for innovation of the year. And last year, he received the teaching award. Um, during this session, he will um, share several of his many uh, innovative practices um, and um, give us a sense of you know how students have responded to these and why he was worthy of this award. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Prof Van Lil, the Executive Dean of the College of, for Business and Economics, and he will formally introduce you to our presenter today. Prof, over to you. Thank you, Kibi, and good afternoon, dear colleagues. It is such a lovely day, and I think that the music that we've just listened to is kind of really uh, almost an invitation to join this wonderful season called spring. And uh, you, and I can't wait to see all of you again in, in real, uh, but uh, let's hope that we'll have a great summer. So, Kibi, today, thank you very much for the invite to uh, introduce uh, Prof. Abhijide Ade Ibijula. Uh, we just call him Jide, or that's how I know him. And um, as you can see, he is a, what is within the CBE context, the person that we would call a young gun. Somebody who's making a remarkable difference at a very young age. And he reminds me of the old adage that the influence of a great teacher never stops. And uh, I mean, that could go either way. But in this case, uh, GD is taking our learning and teaching experience to a different level. Um, I think um, there's lots of, of, of interesting information and remarkable information that I can share about him. Uh, GD, I will not share everything. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's a person who contributes um, around about at least three research output units a year in high impact journals. He holds several patents, um, which he has developed over the years. Um, for example, a mobile application called the DSA UJ app. And, um, uh, uh, is, and with, with copyright, uh, 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 you know, managed through the tra technology transfer office, just to mention one of them. Um, he's also been recognized within the college in se several teaching awards. And small wonder that he's performed so well at the institutional level as well. And he's a person who kind of brings in a substantial number of grants um, for which we are very thankful because this is much required in the CBE postgraduate environment. But here comes the interesting thing. I think great teachers always have uh, good minds that come that goes to the territory, but they need to have great hearts as well. And if you have both a good mind and a good heart, they tend to, they tend to not to, to battle with each other, but they they wrestle a bit with each other. And uh, the one thing that I know about GD that he's a really a talented kind of person. And I've often, you know, when we, you know, GD, when we walk around and have a nice chat, I say, GD, just chill a bit, get that balance right, and then he rides off in the sunset and goes and do two more wonderful things. So, <laughs> but that's how I know GD. GD is probably one of the most passionate people that I know. And it's my absolute pleasure uh, uh, to, to do, introduce him today and for him to share the matters of his mind, the matters of his heart. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I give you GD. Thank, thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof. Anil. Thank you for your support. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to be here and to present um, uh, the things, like you said, the matters of my heart, the things that is, teaching is very dear to my heart. Uh, if I wasn't paid, I would still do the job. So that's how good I love to teach. Um, I'm just going to try to share my screen now and, and try to get a confirmation that everyone can see my screen before I get started. Um, yes, we can. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Neil. Thanks to my department as well, Applied Information Systems. Stella, thank you for the support. And, and UJ, whoa, uh, UJ is the place to, to just fly. Um, since I joined UJ, it's, it's just been one opportunity after the other. So thank you to the University of Johannesburg, the fourth Industrial Revolution Drive as well. It's been fantastic. So today, I will just share with you, um, I won't try to bore you, I'll go straight to the innovations. If you see the way I titled it, I said teaching innovations. However, there's kind of like a background of my portfolio as well. Uh, why I do what I do and things like that. Um, my friends in, um, in uh, uh, education know a lot about that. So I'm not even an expert in that education pedagogy uh, space. But I have a few ideas of my own that I'm going to share today. So let's get started. Uh, thank, first, thank you for one hour as well, because there's quite a lot I want to go through. So um, today I'm going to go through things. First, I'll, I'll introduce myself, tell you guys what, uh, where I come from, background-wise, in terms of training, educational training. Then I'll talk about uh, my teaching objectives, what I'm trying to drive at, philosophy behind my teaching. Uh, mainly it's the first, the theoretical educational philosophy, and the one that is specific to the, to to the content that I teach. Then I'll talk about pedagogy, my style of doing stuff, then we get to the juicy part, which is the innovations, uh, which a lot of students actually like that part. Then I'll talk about evaluations. Uh, for every good, there's always a bad side. Things that I'm trying to improve on, I'll talk about those things. I'll share some impacts and, re um, and reflections. Then I'll talk about uh, publications that have actually come out of teaching innovations, which is like killing two birds with one stone. So let's say you create a piece of technology, it assists you in teaching, Yet you can write about that um, piece of technology and publish it. It's, it's always a good one. There are more reflections and conclusions. So let's get started. My background, I'm a computer scientist, um, actually completely computer scientist from a bachelor's, master's, and PhD. Um, I've never been out of industry, not really. So even when I joined academic full time, academia full time, I was still actively involved in industrial projects. So about 13 years now I've been involved in that. My research interest is in artificial intelligence and applications and algorithms in general. And the beautiful thing about algorithms is they, this is how you talk to computers. So because that is the case, um, I find relevance in many fields. Uh, like I, I find a home in CBE, for example, College of Business and Economics, where I collaborate with many colleagues in different departments to create some piece of technology just because of this part, algorithms, uh, which is just a way to talk to computers. Then the modules I've taught uh, over the years, some have been applied, some have been very theoretical. When I say theoretical, those are the mathematical scary ones, but the applied ones are the fun ones, which the dearest one to my heart is programming, which is where I, where I get the chance to teach an 18 year old how to talk to a computer. So algorithms, programming, development of app, Almost everybody know about that. They know what an app is. Video games, which I'm going to show you some of the games we've created today. Uh, databases, artificial intelligence applications, it goes on. But then the theoretical part is actually why people would still accept me as a computer scientist. Um, so that part is things like formal languages and automata theory, compilers, construction, graph theory. In my previous life, I used to teach those things as well in my previous um, uh, institution. But then the interesting thing is all of the modules I teach directly give a skill to a student in the fourth industrial revolution space. So uh, it makes my job very, very important in my opinion. So when I'm at when work, I'm at this, work is what, this is what it looks like. Am I, Am I echoing, echoing or is this one else? Okay. okay. This is what it looks like. Um, 
I do postgraduate supervision like most academics do. I, I love to compete. I love to compete. I love to get out there with my students and try to win something. Um, I have a little brand that I've created for my students to kind of increase their skill sets. I'm going to talk about that much later. Industry en engagement, of course, at the end of the day, these students need to get jobs. So like Prof said earlier on, we talk about funding of student projects and things like that. Then, of course, like every other academic, I do examinations, editorials and stuff. At UJ, though, within UJ, I do teaching and mentoring. This is a very passionate project of mine. Then my research is still there. As for teaching and mentoring, let me spend a second to explain a few things that I'm very concerned about, except for the content. Everybody knows how to get out there and deliver content. However, uh, the mindset of the person I'm training, I'm always very concerned about that. So if a student sees uh, this as a drill, like, OK, why are we even here? Then I want to first get out there and explain to the student that this is why we are here. Then we talk of grit. That's perseverance. I love uh, to, to tell the students how important that is because you cannot be trained very soft and you get out there, your first job, you need to work very hard. You're going to find life difficult as well. Then character, because Nobody actually cares about what you know if you do not if you, if you are not someone that people can relate to. So um, that is one of the things I do. Then uh, this one I call the Kingsman Academic is another interesting one, which is just a space. Um, it's my kind of think of it like uh, my social media name, uh, but I kind of use that space to mentor students and give them more skill sets and force them into technopreneurs or tech entrepreneurs and a lot of skills about creating technology, something that is outside of the curriculum. Uh, those are the things I do there. So in my teaching, this is the flow. Every time, I, every year when I set out, this is the flow. Um, I'm privileged to be teaching first years. I know a lot of colleagues um, kind of across every institution you look at, they know first years are a lot of work because there's a huge jump from high school mindset to university mindset lack of taking responsibilities, mainly among first years saying, you have to explain to me 10 times until I understand and things like that. But I actually enjoy it because I get to set the tone before we begin. So when I get first years, I teach three modules in, this, in a row for this first years. First one is when they're in the first semester, here's their second semester of first year. And recently I was able to get this module, which is like their, their second year, first semester. So I get, and those are all of their technical modules, their programming modules. So I get to like, with this spectrum, forge them into a skilled technological person, someone that can create something like an app or an artifact, for example. So here I just introduce them to problem solving. Here I kind of go deeper in the space. I don't want to bore you with the details of this content. Then here is where they can create solution. They can create video games for you and stuff like that. Even though uh, mainly it still requires a lot of uh, polishing at this stage. Then when they graduate, hopefully, uh, they're going to go on and take many other business modules, entrepreneurship modules to prepare them for the world. And when they graduate, hopefully, they have the skills from these three modules. However, I understand that that's never enough. So I have what I call more, more training in this space that I call the Kingsman Academic Space. By the way, the name Kingsman Academic came from a movie. And if you've watched it, you know what I'm talking about. So um, in this space, so. In this space, what do I do? I, I teach more technological stuff that are not, um, that the time and the design of the module does not cover. So, and there are many of those, of those things. These are the things the, the recruiters are actually looking for, which is a paradox. So there's a, there's a gap between the curriculum and what the industry experts are thinking when they get a graduate in IT, this is what they should be able to do. So here I teach them stuff like games, um, more on fire, uh, like machine learning stuff, mobile and web development, research skills as well, and et cetera. And I get them opportunity to get on paid projects, which of course, a livelihood um, is sustained and students love that, love money. So the guys that make this group are guys that at the end of the first module, they were doing very well. So I call them the early grit, all right? Uh, grit, just imagine grit to be perseverance. You can Google it. It's, it's one of the things that keep people going. Passion drives grit. If you're not passionate, it's difficult to get up every morning and do what you want to do to make money. So I kind of explain all of that to you, to them. So these guys are the guys that have early grit. I could see they keep writing emails to me. We want more problems. We want to do more stuff. So I kind of bring them in very quickly. 
Then I have the guys I bring at the end of the first year, second semester. Those are the actual grit guys because now they are more matured and everything. Then the late grit are the guys that it took them a while to pick up, but they picked up in second year, first semester. Recently, I've been bringing some of those guys in. Then we do all of the magic here, and then they become highly skilled, and I get them opportunities in the industry using my network and all of that. So then they exit uh, to the world, and hopefully they get jobs, good jobs and livelihoods. So kind of like this is my sketch. So let me talk a little bit about teaching. And again, I'm not an expert in this space, so I wouldn't say much about the content. I'll just kind of explain my own opinion about it. My objective is just to teach tech with tech the best way. That, that's one of the objectives that I have. Secondly, like Prof mentioned, I'm fascinated about using teaching as an opportunity to create innovations and IP intellectual property. All right. And for the institution, real life projects are very important so that when the graduates are coming up, um, they, when they're graduating, they already have access to opportunities. Um, skills, of course, uh, these days, qualifications without skills, it's kind of weird. Hackathons, of course, I like to get them out there to win. And um, the last one is something I'm very passionate about because I think this can decide if someone is going to go far or not. And it's a personal experience for me. Someone that is worthy in learning but not in character, it's always difficult to deal with. So I also kind of like tell them that, guys, you know, you cannot say that, you cannot do this, you cannot, yeah, this is how you do this and, and all of that. So my philosophy around teaching is summed up in about four or five points. First, mental readiness. You cannot teach someone who is not ready. So I spend time on that. Discipline is non-negotiable for me. Uh, so some of my students believe I'm, I'm too strict. Um, tabula rasa, when you resume in first year, definitely you've not filled any modules. So I explained that to them. Guys, things have not gone wrong yet. So everything can still be fixed. Then beyond teaching is like, I try to expose the human part of me to say I'm also human. Talk to me, what's wrong? And that's where the private life problems come in. During COVID, I had a lot of that. Students writing to me and telling me, I cannot make it to this assessment. And I have to make another plan after another plan for them so that they can, they can get, get things done. Confidence, uh, my local students especially, um, I always struggle with them um, talking in the classroom, especially before COVID. Now it's online, everybody can talk in the chat room when your camera is not on. But before COVID, they would sit and just be quiet in the classroom. So I spent time as well to tell them, hey, what do you want to say? Step forward and say it. Last one is military mindset. Uh, I believe becoming is a grind and I sell that to my students as well. So these are the philosophies I, I work around. Pedagogy models, um, again, in the theory of education, you find uh, cognitivism. I believe in that. I believe uh, in problem solving as a way to think and to learn. Uh, specific to my field, however, is what we call syntax-free approach to teaching programming and also practice. So over the years, the way I teach programming is very different. I'll first start with things that don't even look like code and then move to code and then give you a lot of practice. Then um, this is the, like what the drill looks like with me. I have stuff like um, chapter zero, where I prepare you, excuse me, Every week I go all out with, uh, for the semester, I go all out with 10 uh, tutorials, one per week, and plus the breaks in between. Then 10 labs, which are assessments that I actually get the students assessed and, and show you your progress throughout the semester. Weekly personalized feedback for your code. You look at the stuff, give you feedback. Uh, incentives, of course, students that do well in my module even get money. That's as, as good as it gets from my industry experts. So I've kind of put incentives on, uh, on awards. I call it module awards. Um, thanks, Stella, to see you coming there. Um, help, we get them standby help. Thanks to the department, Stella, great job around tutoring budgets. Uh, we can get the best minds from previous years to be part of the training of the new students, and it's been, it's been great. For every assessment, of course, I get them detailed rubrics and our marks are distributed memos. Difficult problems, I expose them to difficult problems, absolutely, because I do not believe in kind of giving lame content and then high marks and then everything looks skewed and we hype this child so much the child gets out there and they cannot face the world because they don't know stuff so i give them difficult problems uh, they'll tell you that i call them d3s um then industry um guests lecturers and so on and so forth so this is what it looks like in a picture when they start it's a chapter zero weekly routine apart from the slides tutorials 
greedy labs, personalized feedback, one-on-one -on -one engagement if, if need be. Um, before COVID, this was, I was doing this a lot in the labs. Then um, semester routine, every semester I make sure that I get guest lecturers in, exhibitions um, to just on robotics, virtual reality, to kind of get the excitement up because when you see technology, you want to create some. Um, Acathons to get them up, uh, module awards, like I said, teaching evaluation. Of course, I do those so that I can keep track of myself as well. Then results in things like internship, job creation, and intellectual property from teaching or programming. All right, so there's more in that space. I don't want to bore you because I'm going to the innovation, which I know it's why most people are here. For more of this, recently I had this um, article in a UJ volume, um, thanks to the UJ unit for promotions um, and teaching and learning. Then I also have another article earlier in the year on, on, in Brainstorm magazine that discusses how I manage to use algorithms to get students out there very quickly so that they get experience and they get jobs so that they don't sit at home after they graduate. All right. So another part of training that I do in that space I told you about, that Kingsman Academic space, is training of what we call a technopreneur or tech entrepreneur. Uh, entrepreneur. Who is this person? This is the person that uh, can create technology but does not know how to maybe get the business started or stuff like that. Um, and getting them access to, they, they're also not trusted in the industry because they don't have years of experience. But they can, on a machine or a computer, they can create an app. Or, so I train them how to create an app, then I use my industry guys to get them started with registering companies and all those red tapes. So again, the reason why it's important is curriculum and industry needs are a million of miles away. Um, Oh, uh, since I joined UJ, I, I would like to think uh, with my estimation, I've created or trained over 100 tech entrepreneurs with good skill sets. Then um, for two years, between 2018 and 2019, I used to run the center in the CBE, Tech Entrepreneurship Center, where I do, I did most of those stuff as well. And right now we've moved online, so I'm kind of like doing kind of a training grid students in a space that I call the Kingsman Academic Space. Um, I'm going to answer all those questions. So um, then the goal uh, that I have right now in terms of training tech renewal in this space is to scale up um, across UJ departments because I realized that there were some students in engineering that write to me and they say, hey, we met one of your students who want to be part of this crew, but I don't have the capacity yet because I still have my KPIs in terms of research and stuff to meet. So I will talk about that at some point. Um, so maybe in future institutions across South Africa, and then like uh, what UCT recently did, just kind of putting it out there, content, uh, making a democracy out of education, making it accessible to everyone, especially when it comes to skill sets. In future, I would like to look at how that can be done on the African continent, where a child from Burundi can, can just join my online stream and follow a whole semester content. We're gonna have to work around uh, this with the guys in. Um, in uh, teaching and learning to see how it's gonna work. But since we have access to social media, uh, this is what uh, is, I think the future should look like. All right, mentoring. Um, these are the issues with mentoring in my experience over the, over the, over the years. Stella, uh, Kingsman Academic is, is not, uh, doesn't have gender. Uh, the girls I have in my team, they, uh, they can relate to the identity as well. We'll talk about that later. All right, so resources, uh, good machines, um, location in COVID times, especially students from very poor backgrounds. This, I know, I know you, everybody has an idea of what that is. Um, everybody has an idea of what that is. So uh, trust me, um, COVID times, students are struggling. They don't have good machines. Greet, sometimes students come to you with, they've been trained in high school to be lazy. So for you to now begin to tell them to be hardworking, it's a, it's a long shot. Um, the size of their dreams and the mindset, this is one thing that co keeps com coming up every time I interact with a, an 18 year old person and they, they, all they want to do is to get some job somewhere and hand 10,000 rands and um, buy a, a GTI or some golf and things like that. They just want to get by with education quickly. Some of them also want to buy limousine. They don't know how to get to that point. They are, they are following guys on social media, on Instagram. They want to be like, you know, the richest guys. So all of those topics come up. Believe, some of them do not believe they can do it. Um, again, and that's why example is, is important. 
Then uh, the relative status of achievement, in my opinion, affects students in, um, in my mentoring space because then they say I'm the first person to go to varsity. My family have have arrived, have achieved, and I say, hey, calm down, rest, rest, and fit to rest. There's so much to do. There's so much. To do. The list of things to do is very long. Then early celebrations is very similar to that. Early celebration is when you get the distinction in first year. Uh, you graduate with extinction, and five years after, there's nothing much coming from it because you celebrated that too much that you forgot to go back and grind the way you used to grind. So I also kind of uh, addressed those issues. Lately, COVID, of course, has been a biggest issue. Then um, other social issues. I'm not a social scientist, but since I picked them up, I thought I should bring them up. Uh, things like diversity wars and discipline, kids that think that um, at home, since I can tell my mom anything, then when I come to varsity, I want to tell my professor anything I want to. So we also struggle, I struggle in that space a little bit. Then cultural differences sometimes, clashes and, and things like that. But in the mentoring space, I've managed to kind of weave everything together and make everybody of the same military and disciplined mindset so that no, no one is offending the other person and they respect the space, uh, especially when you want to be in my crew, so you have to respect my rules kind of thing. So. So the part where everyone is waiting for, I guess, the admin blabbing is over. Teaching innovations. These innovations are, the ones I'm going to showcase today are quite a few, but then there's like so much more. Um, I'm happy that I even got one hour uh, to show all of this. And these are things that I've created, some of it all by myself, but most of it with my students as well. After giving them that screen, uh, that set of skill, I just sit with them, we sketch the solution, they jump on their computers, they don't sleep all night, and they make these things happen. So first, I decided to go with this one first because I'm sure Prof. Vanille will be here. So um, this one was also um, one of the innovations that I think was well received in 2020. Um, it's, it's a multilingual um, kind of graphical representation. We call them anim animations. Um, an avatar of your face is created and we allow you to speak a language you cannot speak in real life. So I was using it to introduce my students to programming in first year. So I cannot create avatars, um, then uh, look for someone who is an expert in a language to record a voice note for me. And then with that voice note, I'll lip sync the character to say those things. And it was quite exciting because Prof. Vanille was speaking Zulu and the vice chancellor was speaking Afrikaans. And it was quite uh, very fresh stuff for a lot of people out there. Then for, as for myself, I just said stuff about the module to my first years. And the stuff I said were just things around, um, this is what's going to happen in this module. And I said it in Sipedi, Zulu, uh, Twana, and I think Afrikaans or something. Yeah, about four languages. But I don't speak any of those languages in, in real life. So I, I was able to put this off with some of my students as well in the background doing some of the work in terms of the animation. Then um, this one, I decided to make this one the next one because this one is really special. I just discussed this with one of my brightest students from first year last year. Her name is Mpo Seforo. I said, Mpo, can you just work on something real quick so that we can shuffle because now we are online. The problem with that is that our students, um, if we put them with one tutor and they don't like that tutor, they are stuck for the rest of the semester. So what do we do? Should we write an algorithm to shuffle students every week and assign random number of tutors to them every week, random uh, tutors to them every week? And that's what she said, oh, say no more, sir. And then she went about two days after she was done with this app. And I'm still using this app till now. In fact, there was a, a tutorial that was done this morning and this app was used to, to shuffle the students. So Impost Four is one of my second year students. And I think you can read this news in our magazine and the uh, School of Consumer Intelligence magazine. Then this one is another one with one of my honor students. Uh, right now, it's just recently completed. Um, this one allows us to see into the future if a student is going to fail the module or not. So it's a predictive app. Uh, we just put the early marks in the weekly labs, and then it tells us what's going to happen at the end of the semester with high precision. That way, we can quickly intervene and see if the students will need more tutoring time or things like that. Then this one, it's one of the latest ones. Um, so I collaborate with the UJ library through Prof. Maria. And uh, over the years, you're going to see another library innovation very soon. Over the years, uh, they have strategies as well to do a lot of innovation in the library space. So I kind of speak to Prof. Maria, and then she comes up with something, and then we, we collaborate 
Then I put my students on the scene. I am kind of sketch the solution out with my students. I will make it happen. So this is a game we recently created, and we finished this game in June of, I think, June, yeah, June of this year. It's a game, it's a 3D game that allows you to learn about plagiarism. So you create an account, and in this game, you can actually move around the APB campus library. The Bunting, the Bunting campus library, the APK one, and the Dauphin one. And the, the libraries, we've rendered it in 3D to precision, right? absolute precision. So even if you've not been in this library, you can use this game to get acquainted to the library. So when you, you can see where the restrooms are, so that when you get there in real life, you can easily find books and stuff like that. So, and in the game, okay, so this is a screenshot from the APK library within the game. And in the game, you can interact with virtual students and they will talk to you and you talk to them, you talk about plagiarism and stuff. And the scenarios of the game are very real and they're not, it's not like a boring game. So it's quite interesting stuff. Uh, the library is making preparation to launch this game. When it's launched, um, then we can go public with it completely and everybody can get to, to play. Thank you very much. So, so yeah, here's another uh, project from 2019. Uh, this project was a winner of the BC Award, a Distinguished Award for Innovation 2019. This project uh, was a collaboration between myself and Professor Marius Waite of the, um, of the marketing department. Uh, and it allows students to collaborate real life uh, with industry partners when they are being sent to do work integrated learning. So marketing students find themselves um, looking for a company at some, in some modules, they get those companies and then the companies give them products to sell. So in this app, they can capture um, their sales, they can receive messages from the company, they can receive messages from their lecturer, which is Prof. Wait. So uh, yeah, we created this in 2019 and, it's, and the marketing department actually got also a lot of attention from this one because I think it brought in millions of rand in terms of um, their own kind of content. So, um, and then these were my students at the time that were involved in it. Uh, most of them are graduated now, actually. So what I do is I leave the legacy with the students coming behind. So just spend some time with them. Before these ones graduate, they leave the legacy behind in that space that I spoke about. So this one, uh, I know there's been a lot of talk around proctoring systems recently uh, because people are very keen on um, tracking students when they're writing assessment to be sure they're not cheating and students have been cheating a lot. So this is a proctoring system I, I created last year with my students. Um, we designed it. Um, the module was already midway, so we didn't want to introduce it. So next year we want to try it. Uh, next year, 2022, we want to try this. So in this proctoring system, it goes full screen. It tracks all the things you have running on your computer. If you want to open a browser, it closes it immediately for you. Uh, the problem to be solved, this problem is from one of my modules. It appears in a PDF here. Then you can write your code, which is your solution. You can also run it like a normal compiler. We call it compiler or Python interpreter and see the output. When you're done, you can submit using the app. And uh, it works very well right now. We're just looking for the opportunity to launch it. But a lot of students would might not like it because they are already comfortable with Googling solutions during assessment. So, here is another one we call this one Python bot. So Python bot is um, it's a chat bot that teaches Python programming. Also allows a student to reach the lecture at any time. We published an article about this one. Um, myself and my postdoctoral research fellow. So this was one of my postdocs. Uh, we just thought about it since chat bots were trending at the time. Um, why don't we just create one to attempt to support the teaching of programming? And then we came up with this and it will give you a problem, a solution, and to kind of guide the student uh, in the process of thinking as well. Then uh, if you've used Botsa on um, UJ Library's website, and that's us as well. So that's me with one of my ex-students. Uh, we created Botsa for the UJ Library. And then, um, and then yeah, and Botsa just answers normal questions for the UJ Library, things like what are the closing times, what's happening, and as you can see some of the queries it's also related to level three lockdown because we grabbed the screenshot, I think yesterday, just to prepare for this presentation. So these are the recent screenshots from this chat board uh, that we created with the UJ library. Then problem synthesizer for Twitter. So there's been this passion of mine lately. I know students spend too much time on social media. So I've been thinking, how can I take the content to them where they are? Because 
it, it, it's just what it is. It's social media, we cannot ignore it. And many people have been writing a lot of articles on how to use social media in teaching. So I was also fascinated with creating some piece of technology. So this was part of one master's student that I supervised as well. I've always dreamt of this particular project. So when I got him, uh, his name is Sony Cabasso, very young chap. We explained the stuff, then he, he, he got going. And at the end of the master's, we got two uh, good journal articles out of it. One was this project. The other one was Cellbot, which was an AI used in marketing to post stuff automatically. So the whole idea here is to just generate a problem, generate a solution, and post it automatically on social media, uh, on Twitter. Here we're just using Twitter because it was easy to post on Twitter using an algorithm. Other social media platforms kind of restrict you when you want to do that. So here is how it works. The lecturer will select a topic. Automatically, the AI generates a problem in that topic. Problem is posted uh, via some Twitter synthesizer, and it appears on the web. So these are examples of problems that was appearing um, real time, and nobody was posting them. Our, our algorithm was posting them. So uh, there was an Andrew we created then to test the idea. It's called Dev Instructor. That's Development Software Instructor. And it posts a problem with hashtags, and then later it can post the solution as well for the student. Yes, so um, not every uh, innovation is technological, as you know. So this one was one of the things uh, I came up with, I think, late last year. I realized that I was ending up with almost five students that once failed my module, and they came back and they were the best the year that followed. And I, I interviewed them. What went wrong the first time? You know, you're this smart. What happened? And they said, OK, maybe first year I resumed late because NS fast, because back home there's a problem, because one, two, three, four, five. So I just wanted to share the story with other students, and I wanted a platform for that so that other students can see that if you're failing right now, it's not the end of the road. You know what I'm saying? So I created this documentary called Comeback Stories. Of course, as you might have guessed, I don't have the time to run this thing. So I have this special student right now uh, that is, she's extremely talented in social media stuff and video editing. Her name is Clarissa Magunde. So she's, she's running it for me. Um, so I'm the producer. She's the host every time. She uh, interviews the students online and then makes it into a video. Uh, right now, the first episode is on LinkedIn. If you follow me on LinkedIn, you can view it. It's about 10 minutes. Where the student let everything out is at about how he struggled in first year, what's changed in second year, and how we were able to help myself and my tutoring team, and all the experiences that he had. And I've received positive feedbacks from other students saying, you know what, if this can happen to this kid from Limpopo, I can also do the same. So it's been very nice. But special thanks to Clarissa on that one because. It takes time to run uh, some documentary stuff, and I don't usually have that time. So, um, like I said, other innovations like uh, the new cool, like where are the students? They are on social media. So I created a social media or an Instagram page for, for, it's like myself. However, I projected the identity onto my students. My students run the page. They post on the page. They like the page. They follow the page. For me, behind the scene, I just kind of regulate the content a little bit and also make sure the content is about fun and as well as a lot of technological stuff that could inspire them. Like when it's one of their bad days, I post it. When Prof. Marwala says something nice, I post it. Uh, when we make 19 distinctions in the semester of maybe 110 students, I post that as well. When we get funding, I post it. So, uh, and the person who is managing this as well, as you might have guessed, is Clarissa. Um, and then some other inspiring things like some medals and stuff we posted. Currently, we have about 252, um, 252 followers on that page. And the students can follow as well, uh, no matter where you are. Um, your students can follow, uh, no matter your department. Because the future of this, the way I dream of it, is that I want to scale it for everyone, and, and the impact can be large. New cool, uh, before COVID, this was before COVID. Of course, you could see nobody had like a mask in sight. Before COVID, uh, I always get my industry partners sometimes to, to take my students out for lunch. We go to STH, uh, Provanil, that's your space. And especially, these are my tutors. So the tutors are very instrumental. So I kind of get out there with them so that the students in first year can look and suburb well. You know, like when I get to second year, if I do well, I'm going to be a tutor and I'm going to get on the squad and have lunch and, and have a good time. So another thing I call new cool are birthdays. We celebrate birthdays. This was also before COVID. This picture is from 2019. 
and it was this young man's birthday here and all of us were just there and of course cost is, is managed by the industry so why not they new cool incentives absolutely so um i've been able to collaborate with this company called bridge labs fantastic guys young folks and uh they placed five thousand <laughs> yes i'm aware yeah they placed 5,000 rands um, every year, uh, 10,000 rand every year, five, five, uh, top female student and overall best student. And um, so I collaborate with those guys and they pay straight into the student's account to say you did well in Prof. Gilles module, congratulations. So we also give them the certificates and all of that and all of that. And then this is something that when it comes in for the students, it's a lot of money, you know, and they are actually happy with and they want to do better. So other innovations, currently I'm working on loss aversion game with the finance department, Judy, uh, Jody, uh, Jody Bolton. I'm working with Jody Bolton. Also some students are involved between myself and Jody and we were, we meet regularly with the students to discuss a new game, a new video game. Uh, problem synthesizers. So I have this group of algorithms that I use across different modules to generate problems so that uh, the student can practice more and so that uh, assessment problems are not repeated. That way students can see, you know what, since the problem is not coming back, there's no point memorizing. I'm going to stay here and study this content. So it's been having, and I've published a lot of articles in that space as well, because the technique behind that is something publishable in my science. So automatic feedback generation, to give 140 students feedback is, is crazy, is daunting, it's time consuming. So I have some algorithms that looks at the mark and the performance and the pattern of the student's assessment and generates feedbacks that could help the students immediately. Then um, tweeting of programming exercises, I showed you that earlier on, I think, yeah. Then sometimes it's not also like an innovation, it's like just being resourceful around. Uh, last year during COVID, I was on the internet everywhere speaking to different organizations. I spoke to IBM, Google, all those big shots. And I spoke to Coursera to say, uh, guys, I'll give us free licenses, and, and they were thinking along those lines as well. Uh, so uh, I collaborated with Prof. Uh, Charis Ali as well, an engineering faculty, and uh, we were able to secure 10,000 licenses for staff and students at UJ, and there was a lot of positive responses. This um, licenses, an estimated value was over 1.5 billion in US dollars. So for over eight months, a lot of people got certifications on Coursera, some people are listening to me now, they remember those things on their CV that they got last year. So it was a collaboration between myself and Prof. And Charis. And it's not really an innovation, it's just something that when you are restless on the internet, you might be able to pull up. Then in 2018, I think that this was the year, this is an exhibition. Exhibitions are powerful in switching students' mindset because uh, this year I was able to organize with this my colleagues, this my industry partners, and these guys, this is Kola, this is Musa Kalenga, they came with the, they bought the bot from uh, Bridge Labs. My, stu my previous students are the ones programming the bot in the company at the time. So uh, we arranged for them to bring it to the library and students were interacting with the bot. So it was kind of like fourth industrial revolution that was uh, very, very obvious. Uh, like people could see, oh, four hour, oh, I can see it. And students next day in the lab, they showed more passion and more grit, if you like. Then um, this one, um, I don't like to leave the cultural part out of it. Show us the money, Prof. <laughs> right. So I don't like to leave cultural part out of it because when you understand people culturally, then you might be able to influence them even more. So uh, mainly my local students love piano, I'm a piano. So I have a student uh, uh, called Amo. He's one of my tutors this year. He's one of the guys who is like the DJ boy, knows the right music every time. So in my modules, I just kind of tell him to recommend one nice, um, what's it called? Piano mix. And balcony mix is always a nice one. So when he recommends it, I put it on right there on, on Blackboard. So that Blackboard can stop becoming that scary place you go to when the lecturer tries to nag you, to a place you go to to have fun or listen to some music or whatever sometimes. So kind of entertainment. Then things that are related to relaxation. Last year, COVID was very stressful. So uh, I organized what I called a, a virtual braille. So it's kind of the first of its kind. And I had friends even connecting outside of South Africa. And my students were there as well. The idea was that you bribe your meet in your house. And then you connect to the Zoom and we just chat about how you're coping with COVID and the lockdown and everything. And then, uh, yeah, it, it was quite fun. Um, 
Then before that time, before COVID 2019, I was able to organize what uh, like um, a yoga session with restorative yoga, we called it, with this lady, Elisa. Uh, it's a business. And she, she said she didn't mind to come before exams to help students to kind of relax and unwind. So we're at the UJ library and we kind of co-hosted it with virtual reality at the time. So if you're not keen on yoga, you can just do VR. Like you can see here, there's a student here doing VR at the time. But the rest of the students, and these were mainly students from my classroom. So uh, enough of innovation. There's still a lot more, but then uh, another opportunity that I get and I'm running out of time, I have to, I will probably share some of them. Um, so evaluations and uh, impact, uh, impact and reflections. Um, in terms of reach, I've been able to get out there a number of times when I get the opportunity to talk about these things and kind of like um, find collaborators as well and put the university on the map and other things like that. Um, so like I've been on ENC News to talk about hackathons and uh, this is uh, Minister Yandla Dudlo um, at one of the hackathons. Been on radio, given several talks especially for undergraduate students as well, on direction, on career, on jobs, on where are the future jobs. Those are my passion topics. Then um, for job creation, uh, this picture is very recent. This is 2020 in the beginning when the, I think the pandemic was low and we met at Bridge Labs. It's one of our, my affiliate companies. This guy, I am my graduate only every year. So, and these are my students that just finished at the time. They got a good job, of, job offer and and then they, they began their lives. You know, they, they're passionate about programming and for them, they're creating livelihood for their families. So it's like when, when everybody's happy. And this year, these are the students have been able to create jobs for this year, within the last one year. Uh, some of them are working on uh, part-time jobs on game creation. Some of them are full-time jobs uh, with some different, different employers, like Lloyd is with uh, Red as a company. And but all of them are currently on what we call like a payroll, so they're, they're getting paid. Um, then um, creating technopreneurs, uh, these are students have been able to help in registering their own companies and, fi and finishing their actual software tool that would be the business of the company. So Teboko and Petolo have been able to do that um, with me. They've been with me for about three years now, they're in their third years. So they have this backup plan in case job markets is funny, which it couldn't be because for them, they are very skilled. Uh, but then uh, they also, for the sec rest of the second semester, they are trying out to get their uh, companies off the ground. And, and the good thing is I was able to get them industry um, mentorship as well. Guys that have, they have many businesses to help them in terms of how do you do taxes, how do you do stuff. So they are already off the ground. And the software they've created is also, they have prototypes for it and everything. Then uh, published honors research. So some of my students come back because of the enjoyment. And, and last two years I had Elsa sent her to an IEEE conference. She was in honors here that year. And no, that was 2019. Last year though, I was able to get Mandela to, uh, to publish a journal article. And most of our innovations as well are publishable, like I said. So this one is called Dev Chat. It's an, it's an app that allows you to talk to, um, I'm checking the time now allows you to talk to a deaf person while the person is chatting with you at the time. So we created the app and we were able to publish it in a, in a DHT created journal. Then, um, so honors, at honors level students get to publish. Then uh, Hackathon wins. Of course, like I said, I love to compete, I love to win. So before COVID, it was a whole lot of business for me. We would get out there with 15 students, 30 students, and we would win every time. So, uh, but this is my postdoctoral research fellow at, in Durban 2019, Sita Hackathon. And that's me right beside him, where he won a drone. Here are my students in 2019 as well. We won three, two awards in that hackathon. Then I get to reach Africa as well. Some students write to me in Kenya. This is one of my students in Jomo Kenyatta University. And then uh, before COVID as well, I traveled down there and, and met with him. And yeah. So evaluations are mostly positive. I'm grateful for that. I know students can be very picky. But mostly positive, so um, the text, I just copied the text and I made it into like, a, uh, what's it called, like a word cloud, so that you can see the frequently occurring words. And it's mostly was like, a, apart from the name, obviously, Prof. Jide, and students and teaching, you see stuff like best, helped, better, improve. The words that are coming up are mostly like uh, suggesting the content is mostly good. 
Then the negative part, all right, every positive thing has a negative part. The late greeters, I call them, those are the students that took time to pick up. They, when they pick up and they understand the importance of, of learning the skills and getting jobs and they're seeing their colleagues doing well and creating games, they now write to me and they say, how about us, come back for us. And I, like I said, I don't have that capacity right now in terms of time. So it's almost like a train. And when it leaves, I try again to get you at the end of second semester, first year, you miss the train and second year, first semester, it's always, I always have, at that time, I'm already with 40 students from your class and, and it's difficult. So I always encourage them from the beginning that you must get it serious from the start. They are reachable. So some students, no internet, no good laptops. Trust me, I don't even have the resources. I'm trying to reach out to the industry though every time to give every student a good laptop. I don't have that resource. And it's like, I'm not the one making the exclusion rules because sometimes I read in my evaluation that they are frustrated and they're writing something like, ah, but it's because I didn't have a laptop. Because So those are things that I think stakeholders can think about. Some complain it's hectic. Of course, anything that is worth uh, the time and money, it's hectic. Takes them away from social media and I'm moving back to social media to go and get them on social media these days with my Instagram account. So uh, strictness. Uh, they say I'm strict. <laughs> they still say, they'll say behind my back though that I'm strict. Um, I believe in discipline, like I said. Yeah, uh, I believe that I'm your Kung Fu Sensei and not your waiter. So with my students, I try to get them to have that mindset that, hey, hey, look here. I'm still, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your coach. I'm not your, your servant, you know, kind of vibe. So and for many students, it's their first time anybody's going to call them out or kind of try to scold them. So when I score them, they get a little bit cold. Then I kind of bring them closer. And I'm like, you know what? It's not personal. It's just business. Try to get, do this stuff by yourself. Try to do one three by yourself. Recognitions. Uh, Dean, thank you. From, in 2018, um, my effort was recognized by the Dean in 2018 with the Top Senior Lecturers Award. 2019, uh, this is the Distinguished Award for the app that I showed you earlier on, uh, the Learn and Earn app. Um, thanks to the VC for that. And then last year, Teacher Excellence Award, I, I didn't even see this coming. I thought because I got another award previous year, it was not going to be possible, but then I'm grateful for that recognition as well. Then scholarly co contribution, like I said, most of the things I do as innovations end up as papers. So I would be filling up the slide with things that are necessary, but you can just follow me and we can see which uh, kind of innovation interests you and we can, I can share those articles with you. Reflections and conclusions. Um, one thing that, that, okay, I think I still have a few minutes. I'm almost done now. One thing that actually resonated with me over the years was that, um, <laughs> yeah, I know you're going to like that, is that uh, Spider Man cannot save everyone. All right. I tried from some students, I really, really tried. You know, some students we just um, leave the lab where we're busy working, they go smoke some weed and come back a little bit, a little bit like, hey, man, you can do this. Let's do that. And most of them later when they see what they're missing, they end up becoming comeback stories. And some of them are lost in a crack as well. I, I, I mustn't lie about that. Uh, I had a boy, I think three years ago. He was very smart, very, very smart. I'm sure Stella probably remembers this story. That boy was even a tutor and he failed it next year and it was just derailed completely. So that's one thing that I've been reflecting about. <coughs> Excuse me. Then assessment. Constantly, I'm thinking, is assessment the future, though? Um, thank you, thank you. Is assessment the future? Who needs to invigilate someone? Um, so I've been thinking the future could be having something else, you know, um, another way to assess people. Because if we're going online due to COVID assessment, we might not be having like theoretical assessment like we used to do. But I found a way around it. Intellectual property rights keeps me awake at night as well. Sometimes the things I create with my students are not things that are already existing. Yes, with the CTO, we can get copyrights. With my publications, we can get the ideas out there. The only problem with that space is that now, if that thing is commercialized, what happens? And I've been discussing with Rosemary, the new head of CTO. I've been talking about possible things that can come from it. Another thing is, and I want my line managers to listen to this one, Stella and uh, Prof. Neil. Dr. Vuma, please listen to this one. Something that keeps me up at night is, is it worth it? Because my KPIs are saying teaching research. But I'm spending time with things that make me happy, like mentoring and, and then developing software and all of that. And it's time consuming. If not, I could also put a crazy number of research on the board. 
And how do we measure all of that impact? So it kind of keeps me up at night. And I remember in the last, I think, CBE board meeting, someone came with a presentation, a professor in humanities. And I believe that's the future. There must be a way to quantify these things in a way that it's going to be worth it, you know. Uh, last thing, uh, calibration and firing. What I mean by that is, again, maybe a metaphor, is that as an academic, I've been thinking, how do I calibrate and fire? I mean, since I have research, teaching, mentoring, uh, innovation creation, how, how do I balance my effort? Of course, I get to do everything. I, I'm still very young. I can do everything. But what do I spend more time on based on my career growth? So those things are like now I'm, I'm somewhere in my brain thinking of promotion in some maybe a year or, or, or something to come. I'm thinking, okay, that means research now. Does it mean I should tune down my innovation for the meantime and things like that? So it's like rounds and targets and the rat race of always um, be measured by the same thing, even though you're doing something else most of the time. So conclusion, uh, I believe students are the new gold. People forget that there's no point um, just spending time giving slides and students are failing, there's no skill. They're the new gold in the 4IR. I think they are mostly coming tech savvy these days because they are used to mobile phones. I think if you give them the right direction and show them grit how to actually grind, you might get fantastic results. Next, what's next for me? I want to scale my efforts. Um, I want to reach many employers and just convince them to hire from where we're graduating and they will see the skill. So it's like setting up a meeting between skill and opportunities. Employers love it. Employers don't want to spend extra time training someone that already comes, uh, if they can get someone already made from the university. Next one is 4IR for everyone. So this one as well, I'm, I'm currently I'm, I'm making effort. I'm collaborating with Prof. Tankiso Molloy um, to co-supervise PhDs and Masters in Accounting and 4IR. And um, I've been talking for one hour now, so sorry, I'm running out of gas. Even me can run out of gas sometime. So uh, collaboration, I'm doing that with um, Jody Bolton, Finance Department. I'm doing some work with the, some guys in engineering, Professor Charis Ali, Prof. Osana, we're doing stuff on data science. And the whole idea is to co-supervise in all of these spaces, making sure everyone have access to this for IR. So uh, social issues as well, nobody talks about the home a child comes from, because that affects performance most times. So um, how do we save? <laughs> How do we save the child who is quiet and drowning? So that's one of the topics that come to my mind every time as well. So thank you very much. And uh, that's all I have for you for today. Um, and um, this avatar of me, it's courtesy of one of my students, Clarissa. She created this avatar recently. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> That was an amazing, I mean, I can see, you can see all the applause and you can see all the comments. That was an amazing presentation and people were really seriously wondering, when do you find time to sleep? <laughs> Prof, <laughs> Prof actually suggested that, um, that um, perhaps a couple of Duracell batteries at night before you go to bed <laughs> to keep you going. <laughs> that was really incredible. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and we can see why we can really see why you actually won that award. Um, do we have time for a couple of questions, Megan? Um, yeah, Kibi, I think we can if we go like five minutes over <laughs> time, people okay. won't um, mind. OK, I'm just trying to find the questions that I wrote down. OK, so um, there was one question that said, any tips on engaging or assisting large numbers of students? Um, any mm. thoughts on that? Um, I think there was one on that. And um, somebody was saying, well, they were hoping that you will play a video or game uh, so that we can access the avatar video. <laughs> There's also but, a hand up, um, Kibi, sorry. OK, um, shall we? Just take the questions. Do you want to just respond to those two and then yeah, I'll take the hand? I think I can respond to the, uh, the questions as they come. A large number of students, trust me, there is no shortcuts to it. Uh, for me, I'm privileged to have, like, uh, like I said, uh, my department, they've classified my module as high risk modules. So Stella makes sure that we get the right budget. So I hire the best students as tutors. However, I still try to spend time with them on, on social media. So on Instagram, on Sunday nights, I go live with them on Instagram. 
to chat about opportunities and jobs and stuff. Uh, I think it's about the student not feeling neglected and not really about babysitting. So those are two different things. Babysitting is when you spend too much time to show yeah. everybody every line. You still make sure they have the responsibility for their own learning. However, you do not neglect them. They, they get to see you and to talk to you. I think that's it from, from, from my side. Okay. Mm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I think maybe you're going to have to send uh, everybody the link of Prof. Daniel Van Lil speaking Zulu. Yes, Zulu, if you follow so. me on Instagram. Oh, GD, me you on can Instagram. show them now, man. This was I was actually blown away. I never thought <laughs> that my EC Zulu was so good. <laughs> uh, who I can't see whose hand is up. Um, it's Kirti's hand. Okay, Kirti. Yeah. Prof, thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, it was truly, truly inspiring. Thank I you. wish I had even one tenth of your skill set, uh, but it is truly amazing. I'm almost inspired to become a student under you uh, at some point. But um, I was wondering, Prof. Danielle and uh, Prof. Stella, can we not do this as a Senate presentation, please? Definitely. Uh, if, if it can improve Senate or any other UJ meeting sufficiency, by all means. You know, we have that presentation at the end of every Senate. Yes. Can you not uh, volunteer uh, Prof up, please? Yeah, um, I think it's uh, one hour long, as you've seen, and we have it recorded. And you know, Senate's a broader audience of professors that have things to get back to. So I'm thinking if we, the division can make it available on the net and just announce it at Senate, and the recording can be accessible and they can watch at their time, rather than fit it into the into the whole one hour after after Senate. Just just my opinion. We always have a, a one of the professors uh, presenting. Mm. Now, and, Kitty, uh, we've recently had two of our professors presenting at Senate, and uh, the other senators might get a feeling that there's a bit too much CVE mm -hmm. flavor in the pot. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I was thinking, you know, when we have our next ELG meeting and we are actually considering the whole notion of agility and moving our learning and teaching agenda forward and consolidating it in a far more efficient way that might also provide a good forum to to show what can be done. Yes, definitely. I think either way, whatever you decide, I'm always uh, ready to go, locked and loaded. So Prof, you can let are me you know. able to share the Prof Daniel's fluent yes. speaking? Yes, uh, might not be right now because I have to scroll through my post on LinkedIn. Um, I use, of course, this um, mm. social media platforms, of course, to also Kind of gather the portfolio of evidence so that I don't have a huge um, folder on my laptop with PDFs. So I think on Insta on LinkedIn, on LinkedIn, if anyone follows me, the post is there. But I can, if you drop me an email, I can as, I can as well send you uh, the link again. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and I think that brings us to the end of the session. I don't, I don't think people want to leave. They just so inspired by you, but. But thank, thank you, you for much. this really, really inspiring thank you. talk. Um, I think you've just given us a whole lot more energy, <laughs> you know, and thank, in terms of thinking much. differently. So thank, thank you very, you very much. much. And, and, and thank you to everyone that's been part of the journey as well. Thank you for always reaching yeah. out um, to contribute to that uh, edition of the magazine. I was very happy to, to write stuff about that. And yeah, thank you to your colleagues as well that write to me every time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And we will send out the recording for the session as well. And um, yeah, thank you very right. much, everybody. Bye bye. Have thank a good afternoon. Thank you, team. It was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Salute. Thank you very much. Goodbye.